Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It's often said that too often the worlds of medicine and formal healthcare take people and reduce them to patients and even to diseases. And so any institution that attempts to understand in a more rich way how we as whole human beings uh, relate to the wonderful, um, miraculous medical science that has made us live ever longer and healthier and happier lives, um, uh, I, I'm in awe of. Design has on occasions been defined somewhat narrowly, maybe very professionally. It seems to me that maybe you're saying here at the RSA that design in awarding us this medal belongs to a wider constituency. We are then eager to meet halfway your suggestion that design might be for all, and I suppose to chime in the sense that, yes, medicine, biomedical science is also for all. This, undoubtedly, is our most ambitious engagement with a designer to date. It's a work by Thomas Heatherwick. It's called Bleigießen. It's made of some 150,000 or so glass beads. It's apparently 840 kilometers of wire. Like so many of Heatherwick's works, describing this piece quite quickly becomes a very anecdotal process. This is a work that sums up a story uh, that links a set of hunches with a series of investigative ideas and that pushes uh, a physically improbable notion uh, that teeters on the edge but just manages to remain this side of the possible. Thomas and his team also fixed on the water pool that would be at the base of the work. And they drew inspiration from this pool to derive the notion of a sort of mist rising out of the water. And then they decided that they wanted to find rather than create the, the form of the mist. And they used an experimental process to do so, that of dropping molten lead into water and therefore, as it were, accidentally discovering the ideal shape that would fill this void in our building. Bleigießen, in fact, is a German word. It literally means lead pouring, and it refers to a New Year's custom uh, for pred predicting the future whereby uh, lumps of frozen lead are looked at and examined for, for keys to what will happen to the people who've cast them. Thomas has sometimes described his project, his work, as a matter of tackling problems. And I guess here he seems to have solved for us one problem, that of how to animate, uh, maybe how to complicate our headquarters building. But in this case, he's also, I think, created an oddly different problem, which is one of knowing quite what this thing is. By contrast, the work of the Scottish-based design duo Timorous Beasties, that's Alistair Macaulay and Paul Simons, is less categorically challenging. Timorous Beasties, as a number of you I'm sure will know, are renowned for their surreal and provocative approach to producing textiles and wallpaper. Their method of marshalling surprising or indeed shocking ingredients, so they've, uh, for example, in some of their work, used scenes of prostitution or drug taking and incorporated these into patterns used in toile and in wallpaper, in the decorative patterns of the lampshades and fabric, Alistair and Paul managed to incorporate images of hypodermic syringes, of mosquitoes, of experimental mice, and a variety of unpleasant microbes. This next image brings us in off the Eastern Road and into our temporary exhibition space uh, in Welcome Collection. The show was called Skeletons, subtitle London's Buried Bones. And in it, we presented just 25 skeletons borrowed from the extraordinary 17,000 uh, that the Museum of London keeps in their cupboards. 
Our interest in these emblematic objects from the world of medical museums was in how the scientific investigation of these remains, uh, alongside the knowledge that was gathered from burial grounds and church registers, could, as it were, help to bring these long-dead Londoners back to life. Uh, the show was simple, elegant, and, as far as we could tell, very effective. And I think a significant part of its triumph lay in the seemingly minor technical detail of just how to show this charged material, specifically in the design of the showcases. Their height, a very small lip at the front, allowed, encouraged a sort of closer inspection that didn't result in discomfort, either physical or, I don't know, spiritual. Their material, uh, their color, the orientation, their pose, all lent the contents a sense of being at rest as well as being on show. And this is the final project that I want to talk about, uh, a show called Identity, Eight Rooms, Nine Lives. And here again, I think design didn't just support an exhibition concept, but it guided us through its tricky waters. In this case, designer Ben Kelly helped us wrestle with what at times to the project team seemed like an impossibly broad subject. We quickly gave up on any sort of thematic approach and with the curator, Hugh Ordersley Williams, we settled instead on looking at a few interesting people with revealing work and revealing lives. One of our rooms looked at Francis Galton, the Victorian polymath, statistician, uh, and inventor of fingerprinting. And another room looked at Samuel Pepys, uh, the early modern writer and obsessive diarist, and I suppose inventor of that notion of self-exploration as, as a form of art in and of itself. So this was an exhibition that focused on a series of individuals, each of whom cumulatively shed light on the genetics on the biology, the politics, the biography, the full range of disciplines that inevitably create our kaleidoscopic sense of our own identities. For those of you who don't know Welcome Collection, our aim, as our marketing tagline neatly asserts, is to provide a free destination for the incurably curious. Our topic, loosely, is the human condition. And as part of one of the world's biggest biomedical research charities, our projects, not surprisingly, almost invariably, start with the science of health and well-being. But from there, we try and stretch, if you like, the other end of our projects uh, just as far as we can credibly take it. Welcome Collection, then, is not simply a collection of stuff nor indeed just a selection of ideas and information. Above all, it seems to me, Welcome Collection is a collection of connections, a place that relates the past to the present, that encourages lay and professional voices to speak to each other, that freely juxtaposes the world of art with the world of science. To bring together under one roof uh, in ways that do more than just slot together a haphazard accumulation of all sorts of everything. Ideas that aren't usually held together, objects or experts that aren't often kept in the same institution. It seems to me that to do this is actually pretty bloody difficult. Let's not forget, after all, that separately defined disciplines have for a couple of hundred years at least been incredibly successful at allowing us to concentrate on one aspect of the world and to get better and better at that concentration precisely by not being distracted by other disciplines. So basing events and exhibitions on stirring together medicine and art and the rest of life takes energy, it takes guile, it takes agility, and it also, I have to say, it takes a heck of a lot of trial and error. So design for us can provide a platform on which to support unusual bedfellows, a glue for things that maybe aren't actually that sticky, a lubricant that can allow the movement between ideas that don't quite run together, or a medium through which we can make otherwise tricky, awkward, 
comparisons and conversations. So for us then, in the end, I think design becomes a logic. It becomes a language, a set of practical maneuvers through which we can try time and again to bring different things, different understandings, different perspectives together. It furnishes us, I think, with a poignant facility for making a show of engaging interactions. One thing that always fascinates me, I suppose, comes back to the central issue of where ideas come from. Who inspires you? Or who might inspire you and have you not worked with yet? Uh, all of us in, in my department probably get a couple of emails a week uh, from people in the world of science, in the world of arts, in the public realm who have interesting ideas. And I suppose we're, after four years of being open, we're, we're a self-confessed sponge, really. We are experts at pulling experts together, but we're not experts at, you know, we have a couple of exhibitions called Miracles and Charms at the moment. We do not know everything there is to know about amulets, and we do not know everything there is to know about uh, Mexican votive paintings, which are the two shows that we have on at the moment. We, we are experts at knowing who are the experts. Uh, so we are, you know, serial uh, collaborators. I think people have really identified something pretty powerful that you have this ability to weave together um, these disparate voices and, and, and to, to make something pretty wonderful. Uh, I mean, there's a bit of me that thinks that, you know, like all interesting, quirky ideas uh, that seem to have some success, that Welcome Collection was an idea waiting to happen. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that I'm in an organization that allowed us to, to make this happen. This, this notion of using museums and other public institutions to funnel great ideas and inspiration for engaging the public from without as well as within, uh, I think is um, something that's bound to, to spread, uh, that I think lots of institutions, were not the first to do it by any means, but this, this notion of providing a platform for other people to present themselves, to present their ideas, to engage with the public, uh, it's certainly what makes my colleagues and my lives uh, as interesting as they are.